Turning back the clock, undoing the ravages of time. Something we've probably all pondered, but could it become a reality? Or are we all just wishing our lives away? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. We may, and it is a big emphasis on the word may, soon be able to stop, perhaps undo, the ageing process. So some people believe by purging the body of so-called retired cells, scientists say we could look younger, live longer, defeat disease. Is this science's answer to the fabled fountain of youth? Hair loss, wrinkles, aching joints, all signs of growing older. But now scientists think they've found a way to reverse these things. It sounds like a miracle, the longed for fountain of youth. But how would the world cope if we were all living longer? Scientists at the Salk Institute in California have discovered a way to reverse aging in mice by stimulating four genes known collectively as the Yamanka factors, which could turn adult cells back to their stem cell state. Mice with premature aging disease live 30% longer with improved organ function. They even managed to turn the clock back on human skin cells, making them look and behave younger. Scientists in the Netherlands believe they've also made a breakthrough by purging the body of so-called zombie cells which harm the cells around them. They're linked to diseases that come with old age, like diabetes and kidney failure. Mice lived on average 20% longer with healthier organs and regrown fur. Scientists are now working on an equivalent trial for humans, which could begin in the next 10 years. But experts say immortality is still a long way off and that we should be focusing on health span, not lifespan. The importance uh, should inevitably be on health span and I think that's an important uh, thing to um, distinguish when one is talking about this. If the technology and science do reach us, would an already overpopulated world cope with populations living even longer putting further strain on health services, building up urban centres and pumping even more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The reports recently published show that the level of CO2 in the atmosphere is at the highest level since 800,000 years ago. And unfortunately in 2017 we will see for the first time in the last three years the emissions of greenhouse houses rising again. While the research is seen as a breakthrough, scientists are cautious about overhyping the results. They say trials on mice don't always translate in humans. But if human trials are successful, growing older could be a thing of the past in the future. Pleased to say I'm joined today via Skype from California, where it is some unearthly hour by Aubrey de Grey, biomedical gerontologist and the chief science officer at SENS Research Foundation. With me in the roundtable studio, Lara Marks, a visiting research associate at University College London, also a historian of medicine at King's College London. We have Professor Ilaria Belantuono, a stem cell biologist and professor in musculoskeletal aging at the University of Sheffield, and also with us the journalist Salman Shaheen, who's taken all this, put it all together, and is about to, he hopes, publish a novel about reverse aging. Thank you very much indeed. Aubrey, to you first of all, because you've spent best part of the last 20 years looking at this. Do you believe we can reverse the ageing process? We certainly can't do it yet, not comprehensively anyway, but I believe that we are now within striking distance of that. I think that it is pretty clear that we have successfully enumerated the various major types of damage that the body does to itself throughout life that eventually cause us to get sick and die. And furthermore, we have identified ways to repair or obviate that damage that either are already in advanced stages of development, as you've just summarised, or else they are at least moving forward pretty rapidly and we can see a clear path towards developing those things. So yes, I believe that 
we have at least a 50-50 chance, just so long as the work is reasonably well funded, of, of getting to what we might call a decisive level of comprehensiveness of this damage repair approach within the next 20 years or so. And, and you have stated that you believe already alive on this planet is the first human who could or will live to be 1,000 years old. Yes, I have. But let me be very clear that that is not because I think that the therapies we're, we have a good chance of developing within the next 20 years will allow us to live to 1,000. What I actually believe is that those therapies will allow us to live perhaps another 20 or 30 years more than we normally would, but that because those therapies are of the damage repair flavor, they will rejuvenate us and they will therefore buy time for us to improve the comprehensiveness and quality of these therapies so that we can continue to re-rejuvenate the same people with increasingly high quality therapies as time goes on. Okay, we'll come back and talk about the science that you, you believe that you've um, studied in just a moment. But Delara, let me ask you, um, in, in your study of the, the way that we age and um, the way we fall into disrepair, have we come a long way um, perhaps close to what Aubrey is describing, do you think? I think we have come a long way. Um, I think we understand some of the mechanism that uh, cause ageing um, and we are able to modify to a certain extent those mechanisms um, and I think that is hugely important in terms of maintaining our tissues or our organs like the brain, the heart in better working order and therefore I think the hope is to prolong health span so uh, to be less at risk of developing disease. Whether that uh, we should be preoccupied of how long we live, that I think is a very different matter for, as far as I'm concerned. So I think we have come a long way. I think we, the we can alter some of the mechanisms, um, whether that will result in very okay. long... Well, uh, tell me in a little while about altering the, the mechanisms. Yeah. But, but Lara, let me, you, you study um, how we can change the way that... Um, we fall apart, let me put it that way. Um, That's one of the things. Well, I'm Gene therapy. We have come a long way in terms of these types of therapies for altering DNA. And it is remarkable the progress that has been made in the last few years. And I just see that there'll be enormous offshoots in terms of benefits for all kinds of health in terms of the future. Aubrey, back to you, back to you in, in just a moment. But I want to bring Salman in here and ask him about um, the book. He's also spoken to you for an interview he's done as a journalist um, some time ago. Do you in your book and the conversations you've had with various people who are involved in this, see it as a utopian ideal or is it a totally dysfunctional world? I mean, do we really want to go down? Now, I, I'm an optimist. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but I am an optimist and um, I've been very impressed by the work that uh, Aubrey de Grey is, is doing and the work of many other people who are leading on these therapies. I think that in an ideal world it should be utopian. I think that um, we should all hope to live longer and live healthier lives for longer and I think absolutely that is a goal that we should uh, fund um, to the hilt. However, uh, the society that we're living in today, and this is what some of the book touches on, um, we live in a society where there are vast differences in, in lifespan. You look at areas of the north, um, you, look at, you look at the lifespan in Blackpool versus the lifespan in Kensington and Chelsea, and you'll see uh, a huge gap there. That's under current social conditions. We live in a society where I suspect that uh, the, the poorest in society will struggle um, to be able to afford the, the revolutionary therapies that I hope will um, come about, and that's just in this society. You look at um, global society, you look at the global south, you look at the, um, the patents behind um, AIDS, uh, HIV. I think you're saying in our current world it's, it's not going to be a good idea. I think we're going to have to fundamentally change <laughs> our economic system, and there are seeds of that. You look at um, the, the, the revolution that Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders are attempting to leave, lead on opposite Well, that, that's for language. another program, uh, Sam. Uh, to you, Aubrey, if I may, I would like you to try and spell out, uh, for those of us that are not um, immersed in this subject, how you think the steps of reverse ageing can be achieved. Well, uh, you already touched on a couple of them in your introductory remarks. The work that you mentioned from the Netherlands by Peter de Keyser has 
uh, of course, attracted a lot of attention, and it is just the most recent of a sequence of very important studies that were published over the past six years or so, looking at the benefits that happen if you get rid of these cells called senescent cells. Now, the approach that I have described over the past 17 years or so consists of seven major categories of damage that need to be repaired in order for us to maintain youth and health uh, um, in old age. Uh, of which senescent cells is one, and the loss of stem cells and such like is another, and cancer is another, and so on. So these are large categories, but they are useful categories in the sense that for each of them we can discuss a practical, uh, feasible approach to really bring those things to an end, to eliminating those types of damage. So this is that kind of thing. It's a divide and conquer damage repair strategy, very much the same kind of strategy that we already successfully used to maintain the youth and function of simple man-made machines like cars, way beyond the lifespan that they were designed to last. Lara, you're a historian. Do you see the future in what Aubrey is saying? I think it's a very complex future and I think that we will not see what we expect basically that there will be all kinds of developments that we haven't been expecting I mean just looking at how gene therapy has developed overall what is fascinating is it started off for treating um, simple genetic disorders but it has moved into the field of cancer and all kinds of other fields of, mm. of health so I think that okay maybe we might be able to prolong life but I think in the near future we'll be more likely to see offshoots in other categories for health and benefits for patients. Have a think about this in your study of the history of gene therapy there, there have been periods when there have been extraordinary advances. Now this may be one of them, it, it may not. While I talk to my other guests here, have a think about some of the examples that you could perhaps give me that were perhaps beyond reason 20, 30, 40 years ago, but are now actually happening. I'll come back to you, back to you on that in just a moment. But stem cell research yep. has been mentioned and, and this is one of the biggest advances. And, and if you can put healthy cells into damaged cells, then you, effectively you would be reversing aging, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, we know stem cell age, and actually we have a pool of stem cells in our own tissue, so we actually don't even need to uh, look uh, for stem cells outside and transplant them. We do have them. Some of them are in pretty good order, even at a later stage of our life. Um, and I think there are drugs nowadays that can um, delay some of those mechanisms uh, of aging of stem cells. So, in, you know, hypothetically, so I think that there are evidence that we can actually boost the activity of the stem cell that we already have in our brain, in our bones, and so on. So, so to, just, just as a non-expert, that yeah. means you wouldn't have to necessarily have them injected into you. No. They are already there, we just need to know how to, to, to right. utilize them. Correct. Correct. I mean, our, our, my, my study, our studies uh, show, for example, in bone that 50% of the stem cells in bone are in perfectly good shape. So you have a pool that could be stimulated. Um, and the other thing is that, um, you know, the study, for example, of Peter de Kaiser is quite important because this one is of the, the, the Dutch study the Dutch that we've been, study. we've been referring to. Uh, yeah. Exactly. It's very important because um, it, it sort of eliminates the damaged cells per se, uh, which somehow block the, block the activity of the yeah. healthy stem cells. So if you eliminate the damaged mm -hmm. cells, uh, the environment is much more receptive for the normal stem cell to be stimulated and to work. Let, let, let me throw this one to you, Salman, first of all, and then, then to Aubrey as well. I don't believe everything I read in the Daily Mail, sure. but it's, it's not bad on science sometimes, and it mm -hmm. says, would you choose to live forever? This is six months ago. Age-reversing pill that NASA wants to give to astronauts uh, will begin human trials within six months. Now, I've been reading about human trials of these sorts of developments for a very long time. To your knowledge, have we got there yet? Uh, where, where is being tried out on us? I mean, I, I'm sceptical um, about that Daily Mail headline. I do think there's a danger of sensationalising these therapies um, that may have had some uh, success in mice, but are, are probably not yet at human trial phase. So I, I haven't heard about this. And I think, you know, if you, you read the Daily Mail, everything gives you cancer and everything cures cancer, and it's probably the same, same thing. But what I would say, as a general point, is if you are 
Imagine a Bronze Age person looking at, uh, looking at our society today. They had a life expectancy, expectancy in their 20s. They would see uh, our life expectancy close to 80 now as, uh, as magical. Uh, they would see antibiotics as magical. And I think that um, there is high potential for these, these therapies to exist in the future. And I, I think we, I, I fundamentally do believe that we will get there. Okay. But I'm, I'm skeptical about sensationalizing it. Okay, Laura, in just a moment, I guess you've, you've come up with a couple of examples, but Aubrey, um, I want to read something that was written in the MIT, Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology Review, uh, and it was a very flattering article, I have to say. Uh, you spent two days with this, the author, and it describes you as a man who is without qualification uh, for human biology, makes no pretensions to being other than what he is, a computer scientist who's taught himself natural science. Now, I want to ask you whether the scientific world takes what you are saying seriously. It, it did take a while, actually, for these ideas to become mainstream and orthodox. Not so much because of my personal background, which, as you say, is quite unorthodox, um, but rather because the ideas were quite a departure from what had previously been considered the dogma with regard to how we might eventually extend healthy lifespan. People historically had been focused really on trying to, if you like, clean up our metabolism so that it generates damage to itself more slowly than it naturally would. And of course, that would have the desired effect. It would postpone the age at which the damage reaches a level that the body is not set up to tolerate. Um, and I came along and basically said, well, actually, we might be able to do better than that. We might be able to employ technologies that had not previously been addressed by gerontologists and actually repair and obviate the damage that's being done so that we can help people who are already in middle age or older and already have a lot of damage. And a lot of these ideas were very new to gerontologists. It took a while for them to get up to speed on them, so to speak. But what's happened now, certainly, is that this has become a very legitimate and orthodox idea. It's, you know, you've even got grandees in the field effectively reinventing the same concept and pretending it's original. So it's definitely there now. OK, uh, just one other quickie before we come back to the studio. I, I think a few years ago you offered, or MIT, uh, offered $20,000 as a prize to anybody um, who could prove you wrong. As far as you know, has that prize been awarded? Yeah, that was a bit of a stunt, of course, but no, of course it hasn't been awarded because the um, goal was to demonstrate that the damage repair approach that I was propounding was in some way unscientific, and of course it's not unscientific. Uh, it, was, it was rather gratifying that some of my more vocal detractors back then <laughs> um, were, were so um, unwise as to actually attempt to demonstrate that it was unscientific, and they basically did themselves more harm than they did anybody so, else. So it was a put-up um, or, or shut-up? Um, job. L Lara, you've had a few minutes to think about this, and Salmon was referencing <coughs> Bronze Age Man and what he would make of the way we live today in terms of our lifespan, antibiotics, etc., etc. In your study of gene therapy, what seemed impossible a few years ago is perhaps possible now. Can, can you give us I, any I, particular... I 100% agree with Salman. I think the example you used of antibiotics is very important. I mean, we've seen huge leaps forward, but equally with antibiotics, we're now seeing the, the negative effects of antibiotics, and I think we'll see the same thing probably developing with gene therapy. But in terms of examples, um, I'm just thinking of children with severe combined immunodeficiency disorder who a few years back um, tried were happening and there were problems in getting it to work and now we're beginning to see children who are being their lives are being improved with gene therapy and equally there's a number of studies now out with um, inherited retinal disease and again gene therapy seems to be improving health there for patients and haemophilia again um, we're beginning to see progress mm. there and just a few years ago um, there was a major setback for the um, area for gene therapy and everyone believed that it wouldn't work but we are beginning to see some productive um, fruits from the research and my sense is that yes going forward we will see progress in this field because it's about as you've already mentioned it's, it's about living longer but better yes I think I think this is really important even to have a credibility in the field because ultimately if we have to take these 
therapies, whatever they are, to the patients, we need to have policymaker on board and we need to have the pharmaceutical industry on board. And at the moment, for example, if we take about medical drugs, um, there isn't a regulatory framework that allows us to actually test this drug in patients as they are. Um, because we can't talk about, um, you know, aging or even health, actually, we have to have a disease that we want to target to be able to use these drugs in patients. So I think it's really important as a scientific community that we really think about which patients are going to benefit and uh, you know, start thinking about how we are going to take these drugs to the patients as a proof of concept. Um, and I think the example of eliminating the damaged cell, the senescent mm. cells, is a very good one because, for example, if we look at the study from the Mayo Clinic, they have tested these... These are the so-called zombie cells. Yeah, the zombie cells, yeah, correct. Senescent you know, the senescent cells. Senescent cells. Yeah, yeah. So the Mayo Clinic has done some really excellent work where they've shown that if you eliminate these cells in models, for example, of osteoarthritis or in models of osteoporosis or in models of a cardiovascular disease, you have an improvement. And therefore, what you can say, you can use these to to actually delay or reduce the impact of those diseases, and that would have regulatory approval. So that would be, be we would be able to translate into patient benefit. Okay, fascinating. Ponder this one, and I'm going to go to Aubrey in just a second. What makes us human? Is it falling apart? Is it dying? Is it knowing that we are mortal? Is it knowing that we have to do things in a certain time span? While I ask you, Aubrey, and I'll, I'll ask you this one at the end of that. Um, where do you go next? Or where, where do the people who study the same thing as you go next? What, what, what should we be watching for? Well, because this is a, is a divide and conquer approach, it means that there are lots of things to be watching for all at the same time. We will see advances in the application of stem cell therapies to aspects of aging. We will see further advances in improving our ability to eliminate senescent cells. We will see plenty going on at the molecular level. A large number of the aspects of age-related ill health are caused by the accumulation of molecular waste products of one kind or another, whether inside cells or in the spaces between cells. Those things have to be removed, and technologies for doing that have been uh, pioneered by us and by others and are moving forward towards the clinic very rapidly right now to address, for example, macular degeneration, atherosclerosis. So, you know, this is, this is quite, quite a big deal. And it's really just a question of how rapidly these things will all move forward to a point where we can combine them and get the synergistic result that would arise from simply not having any of these types of damage accumulate to a pathogenic level. I think I should probably emphasize that uh, you know, I get a lot of um, uh, controversy around my work because of my predictions of how long people are going to live. But I want to emphasize that this is all your fault, really. You know, this is all the media because it's, uh, you know, it happens to be something that the, um, the public are fascinated by. And you, you guys have got to sell papers. But the fact is we're all working on health span. We all know perfectly well that longevity benefits are simply a side effect of health benefits. It's just a question of how big the side effect is going to be. And would you want to live to be a thousand? I don't think about such things. Honestly, you know, it's a stupid thing to have an opinion about because you, <laughs> because you, can, always, you can always change your mind as time goes on. It's like having an opinion about what time you want to go to the toilet next Sunday. You know, you can have an opinion about that. But there's no <laughs> point in having one because you're going to have better information on the topic nearer the time. OK. Uh, put down in the nicest possible way. Let me rephrase that for everybody here. Is, isn't dying and getting old and living to a certain age just part of being who we are? On the contrary, it's a way of putting ageing out of our mind and getting on with our miserably short lives and making the best of it in the absence of therapies that can actually do anything about it. OK, I'm going uh, to ask the guys in the studio, Aubrey, if, if, if I may. That's because you've put me down. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Thank you very much. It's the media's fault. It was a stupid question. Um, but you people in the studio who can look into my eyes and see that I mean it most sincerely, it's being human, isn't it, that we have to die? I think it is, and I think it's important that we as human have challenges to overcome, and I think it strengthens us as people. It's not a nice thing, it's very difficult to lose somebody, it's difficult to encounter one's own mentality, but I think it strengthens us in terms of being a person. Yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one, isn't it, philosophically? Philosophy is Changes as a human I race. Think it's a very, well, I think it's a very subjective. I, I think, you know, it depends. For me, it depends on how well I can live. So if I can do the things I like um, and uh, I can interact with the people, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, I'm getting on with. Uh, I think that's uh, that's probably make me him if I can have a debate like we're having at the moment. Uh, if you know, living longer means like I was talking to a friend of mine and her grandfather, you know, now can't see, can't hear, which means that he's completely disconnected from the world uh, because he can't see TV, can you know, listen to a conversation, he can't read the newspaper. Um, I think that probably would make me human, and so even if I am alive at that point, I don't think I would want to be alive. Mm. So I really it depends in how we are alive, really. Simon? Up until now, I would say our mortality has defined us as a species, and I think it has driven us to do certain things. Um, we fear death, and we try to cope with death. So, um, you know, religion is an outlet for some people. For others, they try to live on through their children, or they try to achieve great works, and they try to um, do as much as they can in the short time they have. Having more time, uh, in my view, just means we can do more. We can retrain. And just because we've been defined as a species, mm. as a, as a, a short-lived species up until now, we've been defined as an earthbound species up until now. But I fundamentally believe that the future is going out there as Stephen Hawking would say, uh, and exploring other planets and trying to colonize other planets. That's the future of our human race. And I think it, it, we should change the nature of what is human. I don't think we should be afraid to change that. You've been fascinated by what you've heard? Absolutely. Laura? Yes. OK. Well, uh, Aubrey, I'm, I'm not putting you on ice because um, we don't want to talk to you anymore because you said what you said about my questions, but simply because we're, we're running out of time. Do stay in touch with us. Uh, come back on another programme because it is all our fault and we do want to keep it in the headlines. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's Aubrey de Grey, uh, 450 years old, but uh, not looking a day over 300. We appreciate you coming on the programme. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, from a personal point of view, if I've got to do this programme for another 650 years, well, good luck to you for watching it. Thanks for coming on the programme to all of you. Bye-bye.